Philip Van Cleve, VCDL, Mr. Chair. Um, well, it's blatantly unconstitutional. Um, we, in fact, here in Virginia, uh, we have a stay on 18 to 20 year olds purchasing a handgun. They're, they're stayed from having to go through the universal background check because a dealer cannot transfer a handgun to somebody under 21 under federal law. And uh, the judge said that means they cannot get a handgun at all. Therefore, this is unconstitutional. It's got to stay going on that. Other states are having the same thing where courts are overturning these exact same bans because certainly, I guarantee people from 18 to 20, 20 years old, back when this, when, when this country was founded and well beyond the Civil War, were all able to own firearms. So there's no historical precedent for um, for this. Thank you very much, we oppose. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, as Mr. Van Cleve stated, the 18 to 21 year old prohibition on firearms is unconstitutional. In fact, a judge in Virginia just recently ruled that the federal prohibition on sales of handguns to 18, 19 and 20 year olds was unconstitutional. So in passing this bill, you will be costing the taxpayers money to defend this bill because it will be challenged and it will be found to be unconstitutional. Mr. Chairman, could uh, Mr. Benjamin comment? We heard some things about a recent case. And <coughs> That's I've correct, not Mr. Read Mr. Chairman. It. Yeah. Um, the recent decision I'm familiar with came from uh, the U.S. Federal District Court based here in Richmond, and the, the opinion was handed down last May, May of 2023. And the case involved a challenge by several um, under 21, above 18-year-olds challenging their right, uh, challenging a statute that prohibited, a federal statute that prohibited their purchasing a firearm. Uh, the holding of the court uh, was basically that this was a violation of the Second Amendment. Uh, and the court reasoned that the right to bear arms included the right to purchase or acquire firearms. The court found that uh, 18 and 19 and 20 year olds uh, were part of the people referenced in the Second Amendment and that there was no uh, historical tradition analogous to the statutes that were being challenged. In short, the court concluded that the government had not met their burden of showing that the restrictions on purchasing guns by 18 to 20 year olds was part of the nation's historical tradition. That opinion, that, that decision is on appeal to the Fourth Circuit. I've said before that uh, the state of the law concerning Second Amendment analysis is in flux. It's virtually impossible to say that any particular proposed statute is unconstitutional. We won't know that until the U.S. Supreme Court rules or the Fourth Circuit rules. But uh, you should know that uh, in this, what I would say is a very well-reasoned opinion from uh, the U.S. District Court, uh, this most likely, under the current analysis of Second Amendment, would be held unconstitutional. Chairman. Senator Stewart. I mean, we, our council has told us it is clearly unconstitutional, and we've had, or most likely is clearly unconstitutional. I'm sorry, not to put words in his mouth. And, <laughs> and I thought this body didn't adopt laws that we believed might be unconstitutional. So with that, I'd move to pass the bill by. Second. Uh, I'll okay. substitute motion to report and report to finance. Okay, it's been a substitute motion to report and re-refer the bill to finance. Uh, and no further discussion, the clerk will open the roll. Ayes nine, no six. Senator Salim, you reported, or you, well, you're off to finance. Majority, but you wouldn't know it. Well. That's all it takes, right? I, I think we're waiting for Pat to come in. There we go. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I can't. I can't hear anybody, Pat, but I can see you. William, can you hear her or hear me? 
You can hear Pat? Okay, so I may have something on my end. I'll come back in. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. And I'm really excited to welcome William Kurt from the very popular YouTube channel, Washington Gun Law. Welcome, William. And Pat, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So um, do you want to touch base a little bit? Um, I know everybody is dying to hear reliable details on this recent um, executive order from Uncle Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Are you talking about the you new wanna... ATF rule? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, and welcome to everyone in Virginia, and thanks for all of you who subscribe to the channel out there. I greatly appreciate it. Um, the ATF has been kicking this idea around for a while. We knew that this was coming. This is a new rule which would uh, further define what it means to be engaged in the business of selling firearms. Because, of course, if you're engaged in the business of selling firearms, then you need to be federally licensed. Uh, and what the ATF and the Biden administration are trying to do by this rule is to shut down gun shows, private sales, or anything of that nature um, because they believe that the lawful and responsible gun owner nationwide is the cause of our gun violence problem in this country. Um, the big problem for us as lawful and responsible gun owners nationwide is unlike many of the other ATF rules, which were clearly way out of step with their statutory authority. Take, for example, the rule on pistol braces, the rule on unfinished frames and receivers, the rule on bump stocks. Um, where they really had no statutory authority to do what they were doing. Unfortunately, here, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which was passed uh, last year, does provide ATF with much more solid ground to further define these terms. And so this rule is going to be a lot more difficult to knock down than some of the other attempts that we've seen by the ATF since Biden took office. So all of this is possible because of the uh, quote unquote bipartisan safer communities act. Is that correct? Well, all of this is possible anytime you have an administration that's willing to turn the ATF loose, like some kind of a rabbit attack dog that you just let off the leash. And that's what we've seen in this particular administration. Um, what makes this more legally plausible and defensible is the fact that the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act did go back in and define federal statutes as what it were as, as far as it, how it relates to being engaged in the business of selling firearms. So, uh, unlike with the pistol brace rule, where there was no change in legislation, the bump stock rule, where there was no change in legislation, the rule on unfinished frames and receivers, there was no change in legislation. This is a product of an actual change in federal legislation. So that gives it a whole lot more clout. <laughs> well, it gives it, yeah, exactly, Philip. It gives it also the inability to strike. If you take a look at every rule that ATF has tried to shove down the throat of lawful, responsible gun owners since the Biden administration took over, they've all been struck down on what grounds? It's not Second Amendment grounds. They've been struck down on the fact that the rules violated the Administrative Procedure Act. That is, as yes. they acted outside the statutory scope of what Congress had delegated them in the way of authority. This one, I'm not sure, and there will be lawsuits, there will clearly be lawsuits over this, but I'm not sure that those arguments are going to be as solid because there was a shift in actual federal legislation as well. Yeah, they gave them the authority to do some of this stuff, uh, even right. if it, it right. uh, even if it wasn't quite as obvious, maybe as we thought it was. Right. I mean, it wouldn't have stopped the ATF and the Biden administration from doing this, but what it's going to probably do is hamstring those that are challenging it from making as effective as arguments as they have on some of the other ATF overreach issues that we've seen in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think uh, that that was a uh, that that whole uh, bill that they passed that was a Trojan horse in a lot of ways. There's a lot of stuff hiding in there. Well, yeah, and I think it's I think there's a valuable lesson for everybody in Virginia here. 
um, which is if you give them an inch, they will, in fact, take a mile. And they really will. And when you take a look at it, and there were some people, you take a look at the National Association for Gun Rights, Dudley Brown, very critical of the people who are supporting the Bipartisan Safer Community Act. And they were kind of, you know, blowing them off like, oh, you're just really getting focused on semantics. Well, it was those semantics now that are being used to justify ATF's actions. So, um, you know, I think some of the critics of that bipartisan and I'm not being critical of bipartisan legislation. I'm just being critical of this particular piece of bipartisan legislation. Yeah, they didn't need to. The Republicans didn't need to be a part of this. And they should have. Uh, they should have not. You know, we had to, the rhinos. It was a feel good. It was a feel good thing because they'd had the, the horrific shooting in Buffalo, which was horrific. OK, it was absolutely horrific. And, and it was kind of like it was almost like congressional virtue signaling. Right. Like, let's yeah. do something so that we feel good about ourselves and maybe some of our voters feel good that we're trying to do something. But again. You know, and I go back and this is for people who geek out on my channel, they'll know that I, I pound away at this statistic over and over and over. 88.8% of all gun crimes are committed by individuals who are unlawfully possessing the firearm at the time they commit the crime. That's not my statistics. That's the United States Department of Justice statistics that say that. So why then do we not write at least 88 to 90% of our gun laws to affect that identifiable demographic group. But instead, as we saw in the Virginia state legislature this past year, we write 100% of our gun legislation to affect all the people who are just the lawful, responsible gun owners who are just trying to, you know, preserve their family's lives. That's all. Yeah. And they're, they're screaming about, oh my God, we've got all this, this crime wave, this, all these, the gun violence has gone up. You know, where we're seeing it is in the same old places. Right. Uh, you know, where I live, I don't know when there was a murder anywhere near me. And maybe it's been a, a least within some miles. But uh, you go to Richmond and you, I can point you where every night you got a shooting in Gilpin Court or wherever. These are the poor areas. A lot of, a lot of uh, drugs going on there. A lot of other Even illegal activity. Community. Yeah. You don't see shootings all over the place. We don't hear about it's always in certain areas. Yeah, maybe that's going up. Well, when you defund the police, things are going to go wrong. When you when you hamstring the police from doing their job, uh, when you're letting these criminals out of jail early, you know you don't take a violent animal, a violent predator, and, and intentionally put it where the people are. You wouldn't take a lion and intentionally put it in, a, in an apartment complex. Well, listen, if, if guns were truly the problem, we've seen this massive wave of constitutional carry states in the last few years. We are yeah. now at, uh, I believe, 29 states. Oh, oh, North Carolina becomes number 30. And that's probably where it ends at that point. But, you know, you go back this what, 10 years ago, there was a handful of these states. So we've more than tripled the amount of constitutional carry states. Now, you know darn good and well that if these constitutional carry states were suddenly having a rash, a massive increase in gun violence, mainstream media would be beating that drum left and right. So the fact that we haven't heard of it is only because, well, in fact, it hasn't happened. Okay. And I think that, right. that anyone who wants to tell you that the guns are the problem, then have them explain why that anomaly, you know, why yeah. is that? Why aren't they, well, yeah, why aren't they repealing constitutional carry in any of these states, once they passed it, well, it's I haven't there. seen one article on CNN to tell me that a suddenly, you know, uh, Tennessee has this massive rash of gun violence that they didn't have three years ago. I haven't seen a yeah. single article like that. And they, boy, if it was there, they would be jumping on. Yes, that. yes, it would be breaking news. Actually, on the contrary, what we're seeing is a decrease in violent crimes in most of those states. Well, there was a very famous yeah. author, I always forget his name, but, you know, an armed society is a polite society, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason when you take a look at the Crime Prevention Research Center's uh, statistics, you know, actual empirical data where they just take real crime data and crunch the numbers, that you see four out of five mass shootings occur where? In gun-free zones. Well, why is that? Well, a mass shooting is the, intended to inflict the most amount of casualties humanly possible. And the lack of armed resistance certainly uh, increases the odds of that occurring, doesn't it? Uh, I certainly had fun uh, hammering Richmond City Council uh, well, at the General Assembly because they, they had a bill that says, well, if you leave your gun in the car, a handgun, and it's visible, they wanted to be, fine you $500 and tow your car. 
And I said, if you would stop, and Richmond was the one really complaining. I said, you're the ones creating all the gun-free zones. We can't carry in your parks. We can't carry in your government buildings, not your community centers. I said, get rid of those, and people won't have to put their guns in their car. Oh, no, we can't. Can't do that. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, where's the most common place that criminals get guns from theft? Where's the most common yes. place that they steal guns from? Cars. Why are so many guns being kept in cars? Two reasons. Number one, we've depoliced our communities, so you need to be armed on the roadway because it's probably the most dangerous place you'll go. And number two, you can't take it anywhere else because, oh, I want to go to the grocery store. I want to go here. I want to go. I want to go to the gym, whatever. You're not allowed to take the firearm anywhere. Now, I will say that all of this new, um, out, you know, uh, outgrowth of sensitive place areas when we're seeing courts correctly apply constitutional standards to it, we're seeing those be struck down. There clearly is a historical tradition of prohibiting firearms in very certain sensitive places, but that list is quite short, actually. And we've um, had some success with that, William. Uh, we, um, the city of Winchester uh, had... Uh, a gun ban in their parks, and uh, they don't have that anymore, thanks to a lawsuit we put up there. Yeah, you, you don't have a state preemption law in Virginia where you don't We have do. In oh. 2020, the Democrats got power, and they, they trimmed away at that little sucker, and 18 localities out of 200 have done something with it. Most of them, most localities haven't done any gun control. But well, what I would say to the folks in Virginia is this, is that actually coming from the People's Republic of Washington, where uh, life sucks out here, but we do have a, a very strong state preemption law. And at least the uniformity of gun laws as you travel across the state, because I know Virginia is similar to Washington, where if you're in one part of the state, it might be quite liberal. And if you're in another part of the state, it might be quite conservative. And there'll be a lot of various jurisdictions in between, various shades of blue or red around your state. Washington, is it can be that way as well at times. But the guessing game of, oh, God, now I'm in this county or I'm in this municipality. What are the gun laws here? What's the magazine? That is why a strong state state preemption law is really important for just the simple reason of expectation and uniformity that should come with all forms of American law. But the reason that they, the, the gun control crowd hates it is for the opposite of what you're saying. They want it to be complicated. They want you to go, oh my God, I'm, I'm going across the state. I can't keep up with this stuff. I'm just going to leave my gun at home. That's what they want. Yes. It's not about saving lives. It's about making us safer. It's not about stopping criminality. It's about taking people like you and me and saying, we don't want you guys who never cause any problems to carry a gun. Right. Yeah. I think it's something that your viewers, you know, a lot of your, your listeners and viewers out there probably get into debates with some of their more liberal or less Second Amendment friendly uh, co colleagues. But, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that gun control has never been about the guns. It's about the control. And if you take a look at any of the cities in the United States of America right now that have some of the most strictest gun laws, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., New York City, Chicago, Illinois, it, you know, you name it. Um, and then you take a look at the violent crime rate, you would have to ask yourself, what's, why is it not working there? Yeah. And you, you probably saw the article about uh, the FBI cooking the books on violent crime, right? Or on crime? Well, you know, the, the uh, I, I, I'll tell you a funny story about statistics. Is, is I had to take a statistics class in college at Washington State University. And right as the final was being handed out, this is back in the days when they'd actually hand out real finals on paper and you'd <laughs> fill out blue books. And the professor goes, you know, I just... I just want you guys all to realize something. I hope you now realize that the only thing statistics have ever accurately proven is that women have more babies than men. Now, in nineteen, you know, in nineteen ninety one, when that joke was made, I was like, "Yeah, that's pretty good." I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know. If this <laughs> now you defend so bear that well. out anymore, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, and that's we see that cherry picking. But let's take a look at other cherry picking. For example. How many of your viewers and listeners right now are aware of the National Shooting Sports Foundation's recent report on how common are high capacity magazines? Because they found between 1990 and most recently, we've sold almost 1 billion magazines wow. in the United States and over 700 million of them exceed more than 10 rounds of capacity. Now, there are some statistics for you. So when we're arguing that these aren't in common use, 
Mm, no way. You know, obviously, you got you got three quarters of a billion of them sitting in the United States. And I should point out, in the National Shooting Sports Foundation said something in that is that not every gun manufacturer and magazine manufacturer cooperated with the study. So they're probably the numbers are probably underestimating the true numbers. Well, I think the FBI was um, not getting information on on gun on violence and various crimes. From all the localities, you assume this was a, a uniform report across the, right. the country. No, right. no, right. a whole bunch of the country said we're not going to bother. We're not even you. bothering to report it. And so now you're seeing some people on on the other side of the political agenda here that are saying, "Well, crime numbers are down. Crime numbers are down." Yeah. But ask yourself, anyone who's living in the community, do you feel like your <laughs> crime numbers are down? The answer is going to be no, they're not. What's happening is is two things. One. There's just a lack of reporting to law enforcement itself. There's some people, if you live in Seattle, Washington, and someone's breaking into your car, you can call 911 all day, all night. Nobody is coming, okay? So they're just not even making the phone calls anymore. And then, as you mentioned, Philip, you have law enforcement agencies that are just simply not reporting to the FBI and the Department of Justice. So crime is not down. You can't have crime going down when we haven't re funded our police departments nationwide <laughs> you're not yeah. going to have crime go down until you start actually you know funding law enforcement again well so I, I was even that. if even if crime is going down if crime was at record low levels if it happens to you you really don't care what the crime rate is. Right. It has affected you directly, and you need to have the right to defend yourself against evil. Right, and this is where I really want folks in Virginia to, to understand how bad it can be. Because I want you to know right now that, you know, from a Washingtonian looking at Virginia, I look at you as a state that's just kind of teetering the little blue there, but you got a, you got a solid governor but when you move as far left as my state has, what happens is, is that one, they de-police your community. Number two, they release violent criminals. And number three, they try to disarm you, the lawful and responsible citizens. So your life literally becomes more dangerous. Okay. And that's not hyperbole. That's not conjecture. That is the truth. And then once they de-police your, your communities, they're going to, of course, when, when it hits the fan, you are now required to actually take matters into your own hand, right? The, the, because you can call 911 all you want, but nobody's coming. So you're now having to take matters into your own hand. So we're seeing more and more armed civilians actually engaging in self-preservation because they're the only ones that can do it. And yet then we're seeing these jurisdictions want to prosecute these people for actually defending their own lives. Well, whether you have um, adequate numbers of police or they've been defunded or whatever, they're not going to be there when the actual attack happens. 99.9% no, no. .9 of the time they show up after the fact, take a report and look for the bad guys. Right. So, and that's assuming that you survive the attack. Right. You know, I, uh, you know, Pat, uh, is, it's a good segue to something I wanted to mention to you guys is so um, about a month ago, I got invited to do a presentation to a large Hindu community out here in Washington state. And uh, the Hindus, obviously very spiritual people, um, but they also have a tendency to be quite passive. Um, and so now here they are living in the United States and they're beginning to be victimized themselves. Oftentimes Hindus are mistaken for Muslims and there's a lot of anti-Muslim uh, sentiment uh, out there. And so there, I had so many of them come up to me before I spoke and said, I just could never, ever understand. I could never fathom taking another human life. I could never fathom that. OK. And so when it was my turn to speak, I kind of. I think we all search for universal truths, right? And and I I think I came up with three universal truths. And I think that all of you all listening in on this should really kind of keep this in your memory bank, okay? And here's the universal truths when it comes to why we have the Second Amendment. Number one, your individual life, anyone who's listening to us right now, your individual life, your individual life experience is absolutely unique. There is no other experience like that in the history of mankind. And it is absolutely 100% worth preserving. And I think we could all agree on that as a universal truth. 
The second thing that I think we can all agree on is, is that whatever lifestyle you have chosen for your family, how you want to raise your kids, what your religious beliefs are, what your dietary restrictions are, whatever, okay, you be you. But that lifestyle that you have chosen for you and your family is also absolutely worth preserving completely. We can all agree on that. And then the third universal truth is this. You and you alone are responsible for, for preserving it. That's it. You're your own first responder. Okay. And, and so what I said to that community is, is, listen, I get that many of you won't go down to the FFL tomorrow and buy yourself a gun. Okay, that's fine. But have a plan. Have a plan. Have something more than hope and prayer. Okay, just have something more than hope and prayer. I'm not knocking hope and prayer. I hope it works. But when it doesn't, you better have a plan B. And whether that's, you know, pepper spray, bear mace, a sharp instrument, or a firearm, whatever it may be. And this goes for anybody who's listening to us today that is just thinking about getting into it. Well, maybe you're not comfortable getting all the way into firearms right now. Okay, that's fine. Go at your own pace. But come up with a plan and come up with a system and come up with a way to value your own life and then do whatever is necessary to preserve it. And the and your own family. I mean, That's even right. if you're kind of saying, well, I could be a pacifist and uh, the yeah. guy could kill me. What about right. your little child? What about kids? What about, yeah, your what kids? about them? Yeah, they don't deserve to die. They deserve to die of one thing and one thing only, and that's old age. That's the only thing that people should be dying of. And I, I, I can't believe it that people aren't thinking about that. Of course, some of them don't have kids. I get that. I mean, I don't have kids. But well, and I, think, I, I think that, Philip, some of them um, uh, grow up in a society where you are subservient to, to government. You, you, re, you do believe that government is there to protect and save you. Um, we as Americans, those that actually have an open mind, realize that government is not there to protect and save you. And in many cases, is going to do quite the contrary. Uh, you are your own first responder. Yeah, the, 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 the basically government's created its own little fairy tale. <laughs> that it's uh, it's the you know, magic fairy that'll be there when 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 something bad happens. And, right. You know, it's right. it's yeah. not. But, I don't know why. but then if if government's there to protect us so much, then why during the pandemic, when it all hit the fan, did we have the largest amount of guns sold in the history of the United States? Why was yeah. that? You know, media and mainstream media and the politicians told everybody, you don't need guns. You don't need guns. But you know what? When it hit the fan back in 2020, I guess the American people could decide for themselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, we'll probably continue to see that trend. Uh, I, I was off for a little bit as I had to re-log into this when we first started. I don't know why. Sometimes we have a problem with it kicking out. But uh, uh, also, uh, I noticed in the comments some people were talking about Australia. And that recent massacre they had down there with uh, with the guy with the long knife mm. uh, murdered six people, and he hurt a bunch of others and stabbed a baby, an infant, I know. a little infant. Uh -huh. um, and I, I'm going to have some I, knife control down there now, right? That's they probably up. will. I mean, yeah, you, know. you know, that's what they did in England. They, England took away the guns, and then it was just a matter of time before somebody committed a crime with a knife. They now in England, if you have anything much more than a butter knife, you could be put in jail. I think Australia, um, I'm, I'm sure they'll use this as their excuse to, to ban knives down there, too. And that's a country where there's lots of four-legged animals that will eat you quite happily. And I'd want to have a gun everywhere I went when I was, out, when I, if I was walking in the outback out there. But uh, I think uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see now a well, whole I, new I, wave. I, of. I've noticed the one thing about all the former Commonwealth countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Indiana, Africa, <laughs> right? South Africa. None of them have any faith in the individual at all. Mm. The government system literally has no faith in the individual. When a one bad apple does one terrible thing, suddenly they believe that government must step in and regulate society as a whole because the individual is incapable of following certain norms. And I think that that is the big difference between us and, and them, is that we ultimately have to put it back on the individual. The individual is shockingly solely responsible for their own actions. It's been that way since the beginning of time. 
And that's how the criminal justice system needs to work as well. The criminal justice system needs to be based upon what are the individual actions of that person, what is the level of responsibility, and what is the level of accountability that the law dictates for that actions. That's it. Yeah, and I think I think that, you know, looking at the Commonwealth countries, as you say, um, well, they were all about controlling other people. I mean, they were all about controlling South Africa, controlling India. Everywhere that they conquered, they wanted control. When you yeah, control I there was a populace, colonies in the United States that they were really uh, big about right. controlling too for a while. Yes, sir. And they, they when you control them, you don't want them man. armed. Yeah, you didn't want all those Indians running around with guns. Uh, well, and so and so that's why when when people sit there and go, "Well, the Second Amendment was protected," you know, was written to protect the hunters. And think, no, no, let us remind ourselves of when we actually drafted the Second Amendment. What had we just finished off of? Okay. Yeah. And what was the saving grace to our... What was it they tried to take away the from us? The fact that we could fight. Okay. The fact that we had firearms and we could fight. So for anyone to suggest that we were not absolutely convinced that an armed society was the society that we chose to established in the United States is absolutely full of themselves. Yeah. And uh, they, they want everybody else to believe that. I've been, I've certainly been hammering the Democrats here. I've been merciless on them on Twitter. Every time they come up and moan and groan, I say, well, you know what? You're mad about the governor vetoing this bill on whatever the heck it is. I said, how can you guys put in 40 unconstitutional bills? Why did you go after good people uh, and, and, you know, and, and ignore everybody else. And uh, a few times I've had to remind people about Jim Crow. Who did Jim Crow? What party was behind Jim Crow in the South? What party uh, was protecting slavery in the South? What party was behind the Ku Klux Klan in the South? Well, and, what party is behind the creation of uh, gun control legislation and what was their sole purpose for creating it? Yes, and they're doing it again. They're doing it again. You know, we're here again. We're, the, you know, so I, I don't know. I just pound them on it because this is ridiculous. They went after you and me. And uh, I, I can't forgive that. You know, there was no attempt to go after criminals. I can't forgive it. There's no excuse for them to no, do it. We have a we had a bill here in Washington state. We have a biennial type legislative thing. So if a bill gets introduced in the first year, it can actually carry over to the second year. It was a House bill called a Senate bill, excuse me, 5049, sponsored by a Senator Linda Wilson down in southwest Washington, a really, really good state senator. And this bill would have basically um, increase penalties for stealing firearms, increase penalties for using stolen firearms in the commission of a crime, and increase penalties for a felon being in possession of a firearm while committing a violent offense, right? You know, the actual problem here. And the Democrats in Washington state never gave that Senate bill a single committee hearing. It literally never even got, it never saw the light of day. Pocket vetoed. Right. No. Pocket veto. It just, well, yeah, it just it just, you know, they controlled the committees and it just never got a committee hearing and it just died on the vine. Well, like I mentioned earlier, the Democrats did that this year when we had uh, there were two bills that would have said, you know, if you're a, a second time violent felon, second time, you've already been to prison, you're back out and you had spent a mandatory three years in prison the first time. Now we're going to put you in for 10 years. Democrats didn't want anything to do with that. But that's the thing. As I tell our members, if you take all the violent criminals and lock them up behind bars, lock them up and leave them there as long as you can, I guarantee you the crime will go down because those, those guys are the predators that are driving the crime rate. They're the ones that are driving it. Absolutely. But they won't put them up. They don't want them up because they need the crime to justify gun control. Listen, here, here is here's a statistic that you can every all, everyone who's viewing this can check this for themselves. But concealed carry license holders in the United States have the lowest crime per capita of any other identifiable demographic group that they use to group data in, including college educated Asians. Now you can imagine how low the crime rate is with college educated. That's Asians. a good point. Wow, I didn't know that. Thing. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, because you, you're talking about an incredibly affluent, hardworking, 
diligent community when we're talking about college educated Asians, right? So you know the crime rate's going to be point zero something, right? <laughs> and uh, and concealed carry holders nationwide actually eclipse that. Yes. Well, you know, you you do the same thing I do. You meet these people, you talk to them, you deal with them. Uh, the the permit holders are just the nicest people you're ever going to want to meet. You know, if that's all we had in the world, I wouldn't need keys. Oh, hell, I wouldn't need a gun except for four-legged critters. But uh, but Absolutely. again, they, they, the other side either ignores that or actually this year they attacked it. Now, I think in one case, their own voters came back because Democrats own guns. In fact, some people in here may be Democrat, but they vote Democrat. It's the leadership. It's the people that are elected that are chosen by the primaries. That they've got, all, they've got nobody good to vote for, and they're, they're stuck if they can't vote for a Republican. But one of the bills would have said you can't carry a concealed gun in a restaurant. Okay, that bill died. It it was voted out of every committee and subcommittee, and there was one final committee that had to hear it. And like you said, it never got a hearing in that committee for something like that happened in your case. Well, that was mysterious. The Democrats control everything then there's no reason that that gun control bill wouldn't have been heard if they wanted it. But none of them voted against it. They all supported it. But sadly, they ran out of time. And the bill well, just died. Either that or the hotel think, restaurant uh, lobbying group got to them and said, hey, this ain't a good idea. Well, so and, and also their own... I, their own Democrat uh, gun owners, lots of permit holders out there, said, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, I don't, yeah, I don't I care. Tell you, the Democrat, your Virginia Democrats are a little different than our Washington Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> our Washington Democrats are vehemently anti-Second Amendment. Many of them will preach that they would gladly abolish the Second Amendment. Many of them make that, uh, that farcical argument that, well, the Second Amendment only protects muskets, which is really one of the most ludicrous arguments ever. Because if that were the case, the First Amendment would only protect uh, stuff that's written with a feather pen on hemp paper. And and actually, if you really wanted to go there, the First Amendment would only protect the, the religions that were in existence at the time we ratified the First Amendment, which actually I went back and did the research. I think there was nine of them. And guess how many of them weren't Christian? Zero. So oh, to yeah. honestly believe for one second that the First Amendment only protects the nine religions that were in existence at the time we ratified well, the Constitution? Of course not. Well, when you're talking about the Democrats in Washington state, are you talking about the rank and file voter or are you talking about the elected officials when you're saying they're all really anti-Second Amendment? I, I, I honestly, I honestly think it's a bit of both. I really do. I think that there are, um, I, I think that the those that are in Olympia in Washington state are very left and very, very hell-bent on disarming us in every way possible. So you're saying there's no no permit holders, no concealed carry permit holders, or very very tiny percentage are because you have what do you have? Um, Four hundred. How many permit holders do you have in, in Washington State? Yeah, I think about three, a little almost four hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking that six or something like that. Yeah, I would bet you that two uh, percent is. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I'm sure we probably have more than that. We've got. 700 and 705,000 permit holders, uh, not including the non-resident permits that we issue. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I would think that maybe a third of those would be Democrats. You know, I, something that we were talking about before we went live, and I, I really am kind of interested to hear both of your opinion because you understand it. I know it, it. So in Virginia, every governor only gets one term. Is that how it works? Right. Under yes. Your state constitution. So would Governor Youngkin have vetoed all 30 of those bills if he had re-election on the back end here? My guess would be I think he would. Okay. I think yeah, he would. I, I, I'm asking you out of curiosity. I, think so. I don't know. I think so. And so I don't think he's done running for office. So well, that's the other thing. I think governor. he does have higher office aspirations. Uh -huh. And, and – um, and, and, and candidly, I, I, I like Glenn Youngkin. I think he and I see the world in a very similar fashion. I'm not incredibly conservative. I, I certainly lean right, but I, I think that Governor Youngkin and I see the world in a very similar fashion. So I'm a fan of his. I was very pleased to see him uh, do all the vetoes on that. 
Um, Because, you know, my governor out here has never seen a piece of civilian disarmament legislation that he doesn't absolutely adore. So (laughs) it's always it's it's interesting because I some of the theories about all this gun control was that the Democrats were trying to get him to to set himself up so they could attack him in case he went for higher office. They were they were baiting him with all this stuff. But Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, what what did happen was he definitely solidified his face. Well, uh, there are a yeah, lot of great exactly. gun owners out there. I'll tell you that right now. I, I will tell you that where if if Governor Yunkin, let's say, has his eyes on a higher office four years down the road, his veto of those assault weapon bans may actually be a really good spike in the end zone. Because I do believe between now and then, we're going to get a ruling out of the United States Supreme Court that's going to say, in fact, assault weapon bans are unconstitutional. Yes. So, you know, Governor Yunkin will be able to say, well, you know, I vetoed it because I can't really thought it was unconstitutional. And then, of course, that was affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. I really do think that issue is on slate for the next term. And I think we're going to get a ruling the summer of 2025. I really do. Yeah, I think, I think we're due. We're way overdue. Go ahead, Pat. So if we can circle back around for a minute, we did get a question from um, one of the viewers and I have a kind of related question as well from things that I've heard on the internet. Um, Ron Carter asked, Virginia being a universal background check state, how does the ATF rule affect us? Are we still at risk of selling firearms without an yeah, FFL? FFL? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and so, I understand exactly what the question is. So in Washington state, we closed the gun show loophole a number of years ago. So we have, there are certain family relationships in Washington state that you can make a transfer to without having to do the paperwork. But beyond that, everything's going to need to go through an FFL. Now, I don't know what exactly the laws are in Virginia, but if you, if you're going to a gun show at a fairgrounds or something like that, and you have to do your paperwork with an FFL, then I don't think that the ATF rule is going to significantly change how you're living in Virginia. But again, I, I defer to you guys on but, yeah, how maybe, in Virginia. Yeah, in so, Virginia. Go ahead, Pat. One of the things that I heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, because you know how stuff on the internet gets right. blown out of proportion. <laughs> yes, I Is do. that if you buy a gun, say I got a deal, I bought a gun on sale, and I take it to the range, and I shoot it, and I don't like it. And I take it to an FFL, and I sell it to that FFL, and I actually make a profit on that gun. I could fall under that needing a license on based on this new rule. Yeah. Okay. I would say that under that hypothetical, no. However, if we change the uh, purchaser of the gun from an FFL to another private citizen, then I think we are now getting into the area. There's nine criteria that the rule outlines as far as what the ATF will use to consider whether or not you are primarily engaged in the business of selling firearms for profit. And, you know, the, the best way to handle this, if it needed to be handled at all, would have been a bright line rule. Right. I mean, those bright line rules are really easy because gun owners have a tendency to scribble inside the lines. <laughs> and the ATF, if you take a look at all 466 pages of that rulemaking order, it specifically says that they intentionally chose not to have a bright line rule. Why is that? Well, it's because they want to be able to, you know, cook the books however they want to do it. So I think if you are a person who is typically going to, let's say you go to the gun shows and you get a booth and you're a person that is, in fact, turning and burning some firearms and making a little bit of money on that, if you're not running that through an FFL book or something like that, yeah, then that could be certainly problematic. If you're talking about, I bought a shotgun and I ended up selling it to my brother-in-law, no, that's not the kind of stuff that I think currently, as the ATF claims, is what they're going to be going after. But, you know, I, I'm relying on what the ATF is communicating, so take that for what it's worth. Well, well, what I saw, and I verified with two of our attorneys, was if, which kind of caught me in that list of things, was even if you were selling, let's say I bought, for, Pat's an FFL, let's say I bought a gun from her. I sat on it for a year. I bought a Colt, uh, you know, Python or something. I sat on it for a year, and good Lord, the, the price took off 
and I sell it back to her. And I do that a few times. Of course, what I saw, they could say I'm in the business, even though every gun exchange was done through an FFL, but I'm making money. And yes. so therefore I'm in the business, even though background checks had nothing to do with it. So the truth is, is that if you wanted to come up with just about any crazy hypothetical, there is a way that you could argue with a straight face that the rule would actually permit that. Okay, the rule is so vague, it is so fungible, it is so arbitrary, it is so capricious in nature that, yes, under that example, theoretically, if you are selling firearms for profit, or here's another example. Yeah, you're renting an apartment, you just got a new job, the rent is $800 a month, you're making $2,000 a month, you get laid off and you decide to sell one of your assault weapons and you sell it for $2,500 because you had a really good one, right? To pay a couple months rent. Woo, that's good. Well, now you've actually profited more in a month than you would have made in your regular income. And that alone, that oh, one boy. transaction alone would constitute you being engaged in an FFL business. Yeah, but the, again, the, the thing that I want all of you viewers to understand is, is that the the normal type of attacks that you have, okay, they, they will still be able to attack this under the Second Amendment. They will still be able to attack this as arbitrary and capricious. They will still be able to attack this as unconstitutionally vague. What they will not be able to attack this under, though, is, is, hey, ATF had no statutory authority to do this at all. That's the argument that they don't get to make. And that's been the most effective one. So if you look at like the bump stock, the bump stock ruling, there's like five arguments as to why the bump stock ban should have been thrown out, right? The court got through the first one and said, hey, that's enough. We're done. We've answered the question. They didn't have the authority to do it. We're not even going to deal with the next four because we're done, right? Right, right. Yeah, well, it's all about disarming us in the end. So they're looking for every way to take our guns away, whether it's, make us into felons for stupid things uh, or other excuses to take away our rights. Uh, this, this is the bad. It's scary. Our, co our country should never be in this mode, but we're truly at war. I mean, they're actually, they're really trying to seriously to take away our guns. It's not a joke. This is dead I, I serious. Think, I think, Philip, it's worse than that. I, I, I think they're trying to take away a lot more than our guns. I think that they want the guns first because yeah. once they get the guns, it's going to be easier to take all the other things. And I'm not really a conspiracy theorist kind of guy. It's just I try to deal in reality. But what I saw during the pandemic was this this great reckoning where everyone had to stand up and either announce that they were a lamb or a lion. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, and we all had to take our stand. Are you going to be a lamb? And just follow the flock. Or are you going to be a lion? And, you know, a lot of us that were lions said, yeah, damn it, I'm a lion. Okay. And I think that put a target on all of us. I really do. And it's it not just well, like huh? Second Amendment rights. They don't want you to speak freely. They don't want you oh, to yeah. practice religion the way you want to. And wouldn't it be easier if they didn't need to have the Fourth Amendment, if they could just come well, in our houses? And, and, and take a look at what's been going on with the arguments over FISA and all of that stuff. I mean, think about mm -hmm. it. We have politicians who think that you ought to be able to spy on American citizens without a search warrant. Scary. It is the scary. Way, by the way, just uh, for, you, you don't really, I know you, you don't practice in Virginia, but uh, speaking back about our um, universal background checks, one thing we do have is if you give a gun away and take no profit, you can give it to anybody. Really? Could, if you lived in Virginia, I could give you a gun. As long as I got nothing in return, I, I don't, you're not and, related and to me. as long as you point. don't have a reason to believe that I'm a felon or some other prohibited well, person. Well, yes, right? correct, yeah. correct. Right. But I mean, but the point is that there are no universal background checks. Wow. Well, we did. We've had a, we're, we're going to hear shortly. We've sued the state now. The third year we've been battling this to get rid of universal background checks. When we first did it three years ago, the judge did put a stay on one thing in our law. Uh, he said for an 18, 19, or 20-year-old buying a handgun, they're exempt from universal background checks. Because if they weren't, there is no way they could legally get a, a handgun and they're allowed to have one. So under the Second Amendment, he struck that down and put, the, put a stay on that. Now, in about a month, we're hoping we'll hear the final ruling on the whole thing. 
and we're hoping that he'll he'll just throw the whole thing out because there was definitely none of this back right. in 1891, uh, 1791. No, there was not. There was not. But uh, anyhow, so that's uh, that's our universal background check thing, which uh, yeah, um, so we Washington need to get rid of. The way it works is so if you were my uncle, but let's say you were my uncle that I didn't really know that well but you were my uncle, I could actually transfer a firearm to you. And really there'd be no reason for us to do a background check at all because of the relationship. But if you were like my best friend on the planet, we <laughs> grew up together. We're damn near twin brothers from another mother kind of thing. Uh, but since we don't have a blood relationship, that transfer, we will have to do at an FFL in Washington state and you will undergo a background check. I think that's how it usually is. But I think we, we've got, you know, these, this law and the preemption so, law. So uh, Warsaw Patriot is uh, mentioned. Oops. She's having connection issues. Illegals in yeah. possession of firearms is a crime. Um, he ruled that unconstitutional. And that was yeah. just for that one person. That was yeah not okay a Pat. so I, I think you, you broke up on us a little bit but I think what your what, what Warsaw Patriot was talking about is uh, a ruling out of an Illinois United States District Court in Illinois that found 18 United States Code 922 G5 which prohibits possession of firearms by those that are illegal aliens that's the term I'm going to use um, from possessing a firearm now the ruling was as applied to the that individual, Mr. Carbajal Flores, okay? So it was an as-applied challenge rather than a facial challenge. I will tell you that I don't know if there's ever been a more loaded issue in my time of covering Second Amendment issues than this one. And I think it has a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum really struggling on this issue because I think it is counterintuitive to what they normally rely upon or kind of where they normally land as the, their gut reaction to something. I think they're finding themselves both sides being reversed here. And it, it's an issue that I'm going to be honest with you. I'm struggling with myself. I've done a couple of videos on it. I haven't committed one way or the other because I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really struggling with this issue. Yeah. So I, I think the question though is, is the right to keep and bear arms a basic human right that applies to all humans? Yeah. Or is it something granted by the United States government to United States citizen? If you believe the Bill of Rights is just a restatement of basic human rights, yes. which is what the founders said Bingo. and their intent, then yes. it applies to all humans, period, That's right. end of story. That's right. That is exactly right. Okay. And so what you're seeing is, is that, hey, when we talk about we, the people, we're talking about people who are citizens of the United States, part of the lawful political community. But as you very eloquently put, Pat, is, is that when you go back and you look at constitutional history and what is announced in the Constitution, our creator gave us those rights. And the Constitution merely says that government can't take it from you. Okay. Well, it charges the government with protecting those rights. Right, because. right. And so that, yeah. is, that is, because, because if in fact, if in fact the founders believed that these were inalienable human rights given to them by their creator, and we believe that the creator only gave it to those born in the United States. I yeah. don't know about that, right? Yeah, I don't think so. But I, I threw this up a while back on an alert. Uh, I brought the issue up and I said, well, Doing a little soul searching on this, I, you know, again, like you, it wasn't instantaneous. I had to look at it and battle it because you keep thinking, but they're not here legally. But I also have to say that, you know, you can commit misdemeanor crimes in America and keep your gun rights, you know? That's the thing. Um, the only historical tradition we have is disarming individuals who are dangerous. Yes. Okay. Not everybody and coming across the border is dangerous, but some of them are. Some of Very them are, there's no doubt about it. Some of them absolutely are. But to be able to paint that with that broad of a brush that all of them are, I mean, think would kind of ignore the reality of the situation. Yeah. To say all of them are scholars or all of them are scoundrels, you can't do that. Right. Yeah, we're going to be dead wrong on both of those. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it is indeed a soul-searching one, I have to admit. that was. A, but, you know, when you look back uh, on um, U.S. versus Miller, 
That was brought on because a judge, an activist judge, wanted the Supreme Court to rule basically, yeah, the government can set all the rules on guns, basically kind of wipe out the Second Amendment. He set up that case by ruling with Miller. Oh, no, you're 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 good. You know, that's on off shotgun. You had a it's perfectly constitutional. And uh, now so scholars looked into that and said, well, no, he, he this guy was as for gun control as you could get. But he ruled that way to set it up. And I'm wondering if some of this stuff isn't along the same lines. Let's put some really hot potatoes. What's the one case about the, the guy with the domestic violence issue in Texas? Um, well, we Supreme got Court. the Rahimi case. Rahimi, that just Rahimi. Got argued, just got argued yeah. in front of the United States Supreme Court. We'll be getting a ruling on that in the next couple of months. Uh, Mr. That was Rahimi. probably another one of those. You know, that was a tough one. It's, it is a tough one. It's a case that I think m many lawful and responsible gun owners could actually prevail on by Rahimi losing. Because I think if the court carves out a very clear uh, exception saying, listen, if you are a dangerous individual, and let's judge dangerous not by the color of their skin or their religious practice, let's do it like we did with Rahimi and actually judge it by his actual behavior, OK, um, but then we exclude those that are either unlawful at some point in their life or irresponsible. Then I think we create a situation where I can't tell you how many times I get some 45 year old guy who got when he was 22, got busted in a nightclub with a bag of cocaine, you know, and, and, and I'm not condoning it, but it was just, no. you know, stupid 22 year old stuff. He gets a felony for it. Now he's 20 plus years down the road. He's got a family. He's grown up. He's a productive member. Of the, and he can't arm himself? Really? Was oh, Rahimi a, a felon or is it a misdemeanor issue? Because yeah, if it's misdemeanor, him. argument's been uh, no misdemeanor on earth should take away your civil rights, including your right to keep well, them down. The problem is, is that you could have misdemeanors that definitely still uh, would uh, establish you as a dangerous individual. I mean... Well, how dangerous if it's a minor crime? How dangerous could you be? Why not make it a felony? Why are they doing misdemeanors if they're well, dangerous? Well, that's, you know, that's up to the states. But I, I will tell you, as a former prosecutor, if I had an individual who had three or four misdemeanor assault domestic violence convictions. I, I don't know as a prosecutor if I'd be too gung-ho about having a person like that armed. I do think that they have demonstrated a propensity for being dangerous and As violent. a prosecutor, why wouldn't you push for a felony? Well, because in Washington State, I'd have to have the injuries necessary to charge it as a felony. So that's that's all I can say is, is that in Washington State, I have to have the, the degree is based upon the injuries received by the victim. Well, okay, yeah. I mean, if you throw a pillow at somebody... You're still hitting them, but they shouldn't, they, you know, it's that they got stabbed. I could see where, you know, uh, but to, I don't know. I have a hard time. I'm saying yeah, the, no, the state and, needs and, to qualify it. And some, you know? people, some people really do. I, I, I think that we do need to recognize that there is a tradition in this country of disarming dangerous individuals. Now, clearly, when you're in states like California, they're going to try to characterize everybody as a dangerous individual, right? He got a parking ticket. He's dangerous. No, he's not. He's just a fool when it comes to parking, right? But originally, you know, wouldn't it have been, been at the time the country was founded, a felon was a really bad dude. I mean, this was somebody that committed a serious crime. Now you can be a felon for picking up a, a, a bald eagle feather in the forest, not realizing you can't have that. But back then, that wasn't the case. Right. I know? don't think that automatically a person who is a felon should be deemed a dangerous person. Take for the I agree with that. The person who um, embezzled $5,000 from their company. Okay, are they a dishonest person? Yes. Um, could they redeem themselves later in life and change themselves? I believe they could. Are sure. they a dangerous individual? There's nothing about their criminal history that says you're dangerous. Right. But no. you take that versus the person who's twice been rung up on child molestation. That's a different kind of person to me now. Yeah. Or somebody's committed murder or whatever. Yeah. Um, then, uh, then, yeah, that would be understood. In fact, we think that once a felon has done their time, they've done everything that the state said they had to do, that they should get all their rights back. You know? Certainly, the certainly the, the nonviolent felons. There is, I, I know a lot of people in the two A community that actually believe that way. So you would be okay with a person who had a premeditated first degree murder, 
who had to do 35 years in prison, committed the crime as a young person. They're out 35 years later. It was a horrible, gruesome murder, but they've done their time. Just like you said, they paid their debt to society. You would be okay with them being rearmed? Yeah, the, the age they're probably going to be, I don't know if they'd be a problem, but at, at a minimum, <laughs> at a minimum. Hey, I'm, not, I'm not challenging you, Philip. I'm just, we're having a I'm discussion. Not saying, I understand that. I'm saying at a minimum, the nonviolent felons should be a no-brainer. Well, I, the people you talked about. It's like, I, why are we I taking their rights away forever? Be a no -brainer. I agree. And, and that's why we got a couple, we got that range case, you know, the range case that's right now sitting on petition to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Range comes out of, I, I think the case comes out of New Jersey. Um, he was convicted like 30 years ago of food stamp fraud. And if you go back and you look at the record, he was a single dad. The mom took off left him with three kids. He's working like two <laughs> jobs. And so he fudges a little bit to get extra food stamps out of survival. Okay. And, and in that state, it turns out that if you're fraudulent in your food stamp request, it's, it's a felony. Okay. So he goes down on that, never serves a day in jail. 30 years into the future now, Mr. Range can't rearm himself. That is absurd. That is yes. absolutely absurd. And I hope that the United States Supreme Court steps in on that. Yeah. Just like I hope they step in on Daniels versus the United States. Because think about it. If you live in a state such as Washington State, we got to legalize cannabis here. Okay. And even though Washington State is, is falling apart for lots of reasons, it's not because of our legalized cannabis industry. But if you happen to occasionally smoke a joint, you can't go in and answer 4473, honestly. Otherwise, the sale will be declined. And if you do, in fact, uh, lie, well, now you're committing a federal offense. Do I think the occasional person who smokes a little weed on the weekend, has a couple of joints over the weekend, is any more dangerous than the person that goes out and has a bunch of drinks on the Thursday night happy hour? No, I don't. I really don't. Well, we need to not fill our jails up with, with drug addicts. Uh, we need to fill them up with these violent felons. Yeah, violent criminals, sex offenders, things like Get that. Get them off our damn streets. Get them away them. from us. Uh, the yeah. drug people, well, as long as they're not, now they, obviously if they're committing violent crimes and they go into jail. But just somebody, you know, again, I think priorities are wrong. And so we're filling the jail up with people that are doing drugs. And then, oh, well. You know, we just don't have room for these violent felons, so we're going to let them out early or we'll, you let know, it's like, no, no, no. Yeah. We got this backwards, so, guys. <laughs> William, to answer your question about the person who committed murder 35 years ago, did his time yeah. get out. If he's still a danger to society, he should not be walking among us. If he's deemed not a danger to society anymore, he should have all of his, his rights back. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, again, Pat, I think that's a it's a good way of articulating it. I, I, I'm not really committed to that issue one way or the other. That's why I wanted to just ask you guys an open-ended question like that. What, what do you all think? And, uh, and your argument makes sense. I mean, you certainly justify it. Yeah, you know, you're paying back. You're, the whole idea is we, you say you're paying back society for your crimes. Well, okay, you know, if I owe you money and I pay you back, am I forever? Then continually right. you're, indebted you're, to you. If I indebted. paid you back, that's now if right. you're not asking for much, well, that's up to you. You know, right. if uh, you know, um, and that's the problem. That's why we're looking at mandatory minimums because some of these judges are letting these guys off easily. So uh, the you know, originally we weren't big fans of mandatory minimums because it's good for certainly not maybe on the first offense where something weird could have happened. And the judge needs some discretion. But if the guy's a second, third, fourth time around the ball, the block, mm -hmm. then the mandatory minimums to me suddenly make a whole lot of sense in a case like that. Because it's like, okay, we know who you are. We've been down this road. So in Virginia, do you not have uh, sentencing ranges that judges have to follow in? Do they have a broad range of discretion in Virginia? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not there aware. are... Um, to my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, there are some sentencing guidelines. Um, there is also some judicial discretion. Mm -hmm. But lately, especially COVID and post-COVID, they've been um, shortening a lot of sentencing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, supposed overcrowding and, and so forth. So they changed a lot of things around to shorten terms and let people out sooner. Um, 
sadly, they were letting a lot of violent people out sooner during right. COVID and so forth. And therefore, we had record number of gun sales and people arming themselves because police weren't responding unless it was a really, really bad situation. And if it's really, really bad situation, chances are they're not going to get there in time. Anyway. No, they're just there to start collecting the evidence at that point. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know where you live, what environment you live in. I live in a rural area. Mm. And so we, my husband and I ran a, a convenience store for 30 or odd years. And we had one, um, misguided young man tried to rob us at gunpoint one day and the closest deputy was 20 minutes away he made it here in seven and a half minutes but seven and a half minutes with us holding the the bad guy at gunpoint yeah yeah. Yeah. um fortunately the would-be robber gave up right away but um it was still a long time because wow. you, you don't know if he's got an accomplice outside. What you know, you, it's it's just yeah. not a great situation. Well, what we've seen so, in Washington State is we have sentencing. The Sentencing Reform Act really does put judges kind of in a box. Like if you get convicted of this crime, judges got to sentence you somewhere between here and here. Okay, and there's uh-huh. not a real broad range. And there's ways that judges can go above or below, but it actually requires one of the attorneys to pre- plead and prove certain things. So what you're seeing though to avoid that is progressive prosecutors making charging decisions, okay? Or plea bargaining decisions that then move you down on the graph significantly. And so again, the judge is operating on what the graph says, but if they move down and to the left on the graph, everything's getting lighter. And so that's what we're seeing with some of the more progressive prosecutors in some of these communities out here in Washington state. And I think you see a lot of plea bargaining all over the country. Um, yeah. first off, it's kind of a win-win situation. Both sides can technically call it a win. Um, and second, it's it's a guaranteed outcome, assuming right. the judge agrees to it. So, right. No, as a defense attorney, I can assure you plea bargaining is always a much more assured thing than relying on 12 people in the box that weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty. So um, that's usually the way I tell them to do it. Uh, I got a question for you, uh, William. Yeah. One of our members is asking uh, if you also um, are, uh, I guess, able to work in Oregon. I am not licensed in Oregon. I am only licensed in Washington State, but I have done a lot of work uh, for the Oregon folks through my YouTube channel. Um, but actually, at the way things are going right now, the likelihood of me expanding my practice into other states legally from a licensing standpoint is pretty remote. I will actually be expanding my YouTube reach through a lot of things because I've always wanted to be into education. So this is giving me a great opportunity. But uh, I do love the state of Oregon. I get down there quite a bit. Yeah, and we got, had a Clinton. question. We had a question earlier about when were you coming to Illinois? They need you to help them fight their assault. Yeah, I am coming out to Illinois in May. We're still finalizing the dates. I'm going to be in uh, Naperville, and Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in East Dundee, and I'm going to be in Aurora. So I'm going to be visiting some FFLs. We're just finalizing the dates on that. Um, But I think at the current time, I may have more subscribers in Illinois than I do in the state of Washington right now. So Illinois has been going through a really, really rough spell the last couple of years. And um, I found a very loyal audience out there, people who just really needed someone to give them some strength. They they have some good gun rights groups out there, too. The the, the people in Illinois, the gun owners are fighters. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're gun owners are fighters. They really yeah, are. Yeah, they are fantastic. Their state government, I, I loathe. It's the most evil state government in America, but the people out there are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up there, so I know a lot okay. about that. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. There was some somebody also, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, this person might be an attorney, but uh, Tom Jefferson is saying, uh, that, um, uh, yeah, he was confirming that uh, uh, there are sentencing guidelines. And as Pat said, uh, there's a, just a lot of discretion. Yeah, I saw and, that. Yeah, Tom Jefferson oh, said there was a lot of uh, discretion. Uh, okay, and you have to serve 85% of the sentence. Yeah. In Washington State, you only have to serve 67% of the sentence. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got to drive that crime up. <laughs> 
Got to have that as yeah, the excuse yeah. to disarm well, everybody. You know, listen, do you think, Philip, that there are issues out there that a political party claims they want to solve, but the last thing in the world they want to do is actually solve it because it's one of the wedge issues. It's one of their fundraising issues. Yeah. It's one of the few plat, you know, few planks they actually have in their platform. Do they actually really want to solve it? What would they talk about all of a sudden if they solved that? Issue? <laughs> Yeah. Well, we've, we've argued that, you know, the ideal goal would be there is no VCDL, that we've got all the gun laws covered. There aren't any. We don't need our organization to exist anymore. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, we all agree about what the Second Amendment says and we're cool on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Be great. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure that uh, absolutely convinced of that, 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 that uh, maybe both parties have issues they want to keep alive. Although I'm not seeing the Republicans trying to keep gun control alive. The Democrats definitely, that's a, it's, it, they, it, you know, the odd thing is Republicans have it in their platform. Um, right. But the Democrats don't, but they want to keep it alive because, uh, yet, you know, honestly, I don't think, I think if you look at voters, Democrat voters out there, I don't think very many of them vote on guns. If that's all they were going to the polls to vote on the guns, I don't think a lot of them would show no. up. I think there Abortion, is yes. single issue. I think there is another single issue, however, that a lot of Democratic voters are highly motivated by. Yeah, but abortion is what I'm thinking. Yeah. That's what that's what swung yeah. everything here, I believe. I, uh, I, I, I often, agree that if there is a a one issue voter, a Democratic one issue voter, they are most likely the one issue is going to be abortion. I, 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 I kind of agree from what I yeah, that, that's not guns. And so for the Republicans to be so frightened of, well, we can't go out too much about guns. Well, and they're listen, not going to be know, turning. Out here in Washington State, you know, being politically active, you can imagine some of the crazy stuff I've heard. And and I've literally had, you know, people on the other side say, listen, you, you know, essentially the argument is you got our sacred cow. You got Roe v. Wade. And now because you got Roe v. Wade, we're going to go get your sacred cow. And your sacred cow is the Second Amendment. The difference between Roe v. Wade and the Second Amendment is only one of them is announced in the Constitution. Right. Only one is a protected civil one right protected in the Constitution. Right, yeah. The other was an imaginary one in the sense that it wasn't actually in the Constitution. If anything, I guess it would have fallen under the Tenth Amendment. Well, yeah, it was a little bit of judicial legislation. And, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when Obama got into office in his first term, when he had majorities in both the Senate and the House, encouraged President Obama to pass federal legislation because she believed that the opinion was really kind of decided on faulty grounds. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't always agree with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I never thought she was an idiot. And she was a very yeah. intelligent person. And she called it. She called it exactly the way it turned out. Yeah. And indeed, so that that's one of the issues that's been passed on to the states. So um, it's not been ruled that you can't do it, but it's up to the states. Right. Uh, well, right. but we do have that constitution protection. But we right do, and we do have a, a, a protection as it relates to our Second Amendment rights. Yes, we do. That's right. And so when Roe v. Wade was struck down, all it said was that the federal government doesn't have the right to make that decision, that it, right. it was rightfully delegated to the states. So right. they did not say you can't have abortions anymore. Right. No, they they never said that. Right. And, and, you know, Pat, this is a good segue to something else that we, if you really want to think about what's happening um, with our gun rights, how many state legislatures actually wrote things that they called the Bruin response bill? Think about it. I have a Bruin response bill. So that a, a court, a case comes down from the Supreme Court, and now the legislature has to write a law in response to it. There's, there's no response to a Supreme Court case. You just start following right. the case law. Now, let's go back a few years in our time machine and talk about Oglethorpe, okay? The Oglethorpe case, which said that gay marriage is the constitutional. Now, can you imagine if you take, let's take a really conservative. <laughs> state. Let's take an Arkansas, Mississippi, you know, a really deep red state. Can you imagine that the Supreme Court come down with that decision? And one of those states is like, well, we're going to have ourselves an Oglethorpe response bill because <laughs> yeah, no. gay people no. ain't going to get married in this state. We don't care what <laughs> the Supreme Court says. Now, even us as conservatives would be crying out like, yeah. whoa, whoa, time out. Yeah. What are you doing? You follow right. the rule of law. Right. 
Exactly. Right. But the rule of law is very flexible when it comes to the second yeah, it depends amendment. on whose rule of law it is, exactly, right? Because, because when you're seeing these Bruin response bills, what you're actually seeing is you are seeing governors and state legislatures throwing a middle finger at the yes. United States Supreme Court. That's literally what's happening. It is one of the most gross violations of the rule of law that we have ever seen. And it's not... Really, the only other time you ever saw that was uh, back in the during the civil rights era, where you had the some jurors. That, was, yeah, that's right, where they're like, "I know we got this civil rights act, but no, 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 we're not going to do it." And there's a United States Supreme Court case directly on point called Cooper v. Aaron, and it uh -huh. talks about what happens when we choose to re willingly disfollow Supreme Court precedent. Absolutely, and you know, even the, the in the '60s with the civil rights movement and all of that, you had the um, Gun Control Act of 68, mm -hmm. which banned so-called Saturday night specials. Yep. Mm. And so then we couldn't, that's, that's why we couldn't have the little Glock 380s until Glock built a plant here in this country. Well, yep. I remember, I was a kid back then, but I remember and was horrified that they were actually advertising for support of this act to ban these Saturday night specials and giving images of um, a African American right. with a paper sack robbing a liquor store. Right. And because, you know, because the Saturday night special was most popular amongst what community? Undesirables. Yes, it was. And also poor, but also, unfortunately, with poor people. Right. That's right. You know, people that couldn't afford well, a better that's, gun. That's all they could get. That's but what that's all part of disarmament. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it was that racist. The I mean, the whole go the the civil rights federal government law. Wink, wink. You know, they they on this side they were saying we have to do this, but on this side they were promulgating the same type of prejudice. And looking the other way when a lot of states still had segregated schools and so forth. Yep. You know, it took quite a while for things to actually come to fruition and people to wake up and say, hey, we're all people. We are one race, human, and we, we have to stop acting like this. Well, probably the first piece of federal legislation that wasn't a gun legislation that wasn't based in some type of racial motivation might have been Bill Clinton's assault weapon ban in the mid 90s. Because if you go back to, to the National Firearms Act in 1934, passed it to prevent what? The Italian mafia, hmm. right? Basically. Chicago. Okay. Uh -huh. Then we go to 1968, the Gun Control Act of 1968. What again do we uh -huh. have there? Right. Just like you mentioned. So, and those are the first two pieces of federal gun legislation. So, you know, we didn't get started on this stuff until the you know 1930s. Well, even before that, though, you had um, certain uh, states and localities that were passing concealed carry permits and pricing it so that freed slaves couldn't get guns. Well, you yeah. had to get permits. You had to get permission from the Actually, sheriff. But actually, right. going back to about 1622, I believe in your state, the state of Virginia uh -huh. may have actually had the first piece of state gun control legislation, which was passed to basically say that African Americans and Native Americans were not allowed to be armed, period. Right. Right. And and so so when someone says gun control is rooted in racism, it's an absolute truthful statement. Absolutely. Completely. Yeah. We also and, had a law that said you had to carry a gun to church for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, that's uh, oh, well, and we're beginning to listen. I'll tell you, there's a couple big areas that here's, here's the next area that you're going to see the gun grabbers move in is because during the pandemic, a lot of parents got to peek into the classroom through zoom and they didn't necessarily really like what they were seeing. And so now we've seen this, mass exodus to private schools or to homeschool, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and again, I firmly believe that every family has the right to raise their family as they see fit, okay? 
But what you're going to start seeing in some of these states is if you're homeschooling your kids, then your house becomes a school and therefore it becomes a gun free zone. Mm -hmm. Watch it. They're going to. Yeah, I think they, think they well, I want to say they tried that in some state already. They're going to they're going to try that. You're going to see it. Cal you watch. California will lead the charge. And the minute California does it, then it'll just spread like a bad cancer all around the country. Well, that's uh, that would be a uh, yeah. I would think that would be a battle to do something like that in Virginia, but uh, who knows? Yeah. Well, the whole school zone thing has been uh, a debacle. A thousand feet of a school. I mean, where, where, where are you in this country if you are within a thousand feet of a school somewhere? Well, yeah. Or sometimes you'll see some states that will define it as a school or school bus stop. Right. So now if you're a thousand feet within either a school or a school bus stop area, now you pretty much have almost your whole state covered. And that's what you're seeing with these Bruin response bills is let's just turn the whole state into a sensitive area. Oh, we have to grant concealed carry licenses now. We don't get to decide who gets them and don't. OK, well, we'll grant them. We just will create a place where they can't carry it everywhere. That's a Bruin response bill. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is there needs to be a penalty for that. But. You know, I can't help but think that uh, throwing the middle finger at the at the Supreme Court at some point is going to come bite you on the tail with, with something. Only if the Supreme Court's really willing to bite back, you know. Yeah, that that's, I don't know. That's the thing. You know, all the bark in the world is great, but you got to have a little bite too. What would what would they what would the bite be? I mean, how would they how would they bite back? Uh, the bite back would be probably to issue some type of sanctions against the state legislature in some fashion. Um, but ultimately, what you're only going to see the Supreme Court do is soundly reject laws. And that's really all you're going to do. I know there's a lot of people like, why can't the Supreme Court overturn this law and then throw everyone who passed this law into prison? I, I, I And I get that frustration. We have qualified and privileged immunity for our politicians for the mere reason that it would have a significant chilling effect on legislative efforts on both sides of the aisle if we could jail our politicians for legislation that we didn't agree well, with. We don't need that many laws, so maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> well, you, right. Because every what? time we got a – well, there again, that goes back to the other thing I was talking about. Every time we got a problem, we think that the solution is to pass a law. Why? Why can't the individual regulate? themselves why can't the individual you know why do we have such a lack of faith in the individual i don't understand it uh well again maybe it comes back to the the people that believe in the in the commonwealth uh the the british Commonwealth thing right. where government no i don't so precisely william i think that they want a father figure they just didn't have one in their life and they want somebody to be responsible for them to get them a job, to make sure that nobody makes them mad, to you know, to take away those you know evil that guns. May great. That may work great in Sweden, but that is not the mentality under which this country was ever founded. No, before. oh no, our founding fathers would be walking around going, "What the hell happened?" Exactly. <laughs> so, let me let me ask you a question, William. You may or may not know the answer to this. Has anyone ever been charged, prosecuted, convicted under eighteen USC two forty two? Eight, what is 18 U.S.C. 242? All right. 18 U.S.C. 242 is a law um, prohibiting, uh, actually naming penalties for deprivation of rights under the color of law. Okay. So that is actually what we call uh, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, what's called the 1983 okay. claim which yeah. is a civil action for deprivation of uh, constitutional rights under color of state law. Have I seen people prosecuted for it? No, because it's not a criminal statute. I have seen governments held liable for it and sanctioned, but I have not seen it because it's not part of the criminal code. So you don't go to jail for it. You could be sued or yeah. sanctioned in some sanctioned, way, but, you, yeah. Yeah. but you're not going to, you're not going to right. prison over it. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I mean, it, here's the thing. It, it, as much as I get, I get a lot of people want to throw, I, you know, if I could throw my governor in jail and my attorney general, I'd do it right now. I would totally I'd throw him in jail, lock him up, throw the key away. I really would. Um, 
it's just it's just not how it works here. It's just not how it works. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all complicated. We 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 hear a lot of the same thing. Now, I'm not an attorney, although we have two wonderful attorneys on the board of directors, which is yeah. wonderful. I can get up there anytime I need. And I got two different. And these are gun rights attorneys. These are like you. They're they have criminal attorneys that that do their. Yeah, you know, we got our we got two of them on our board of directors. So uh, you know, we uh, we get a lot of questions, and a lot of my end up referring to them. But we do hear that a lot. People are frustrated because yeah. they're seeing situations where. Okay, if you're not allowed to do this, then well, how are they doing it? Why isn't somebody being held accountable at the government level for what basically some of this stuff feels crazy, treasonous, quite frankly? Yes. Uh, you know, going yeah. after law abiding gun owners, some of those 40 bills that went in the General Assembly. Actually, a bunch of those were. Well, prime example, prime example was 2020 Lobby Day. And so if you remember in Katrina, um, Louisiana was mm -hmm. disarming people that were still in their homes and stuff. And, and so here you have bandits roving, you have um, animals um, looking for food, starving and things like that. And people need to be able to defend themselves. But the cops were going around and disarming people that were staying in their homes. So VCDL lobbied the legislature and we got a bill passed saying that it made it illegal for the government to disarm Virginians when there was a declared state of emergency. Fast forward to 2020, we had our lobby day and our governor at the time declared a state of emergency and said that the uh, banned guns in Capitol Square because of this state of emergency, he issued an executive order, which was against Virginia law. So VCDL filed suit. Of course, the courts wouldn't hear the case until after our lobby day, in which case it was now moot, so the case was dismissed. No penalty to the governor or anything like that. The law has no teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you do in a case like that? File, uh, not, file a civil I mean, suit? I mean, I mean, what do you do in a case like that when your legislature plays a game with you and then, then, uh -huh. then they just pass the buck until there's nothing you can do about it? Right. You can take it out on them in the voters booth. I mean, that's, I think, the one thing everyone always thinks. They think they're stuck with the politicians they have, you know? But well, the, the ultimate level of accountability comes every every November. What do you do with the judges, though, that won't enforce the law? He could have issued an emergency injunction and chose not to. The judge has the discretion to do it. I mean, I think everyone yeah. wants me to sit here and say, what can we do about these people? It's not what we can do about these people. It's what we can do to not have these people making the calls anymore. This comes back right. to all these shows. Of course, our yeah, judges are, are are not elected here. Uh, they're 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 appointed by the uh, the general assembly. Uh -huh. uh, so, they do have to answer to them. So, so, if your general assembly is controlled by Democrats, you're going to get predominantly Democratic appointed judges, then, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes. so the the elections do matter to your judges, then. They well, do. that's true. Yeah, yeah, um, they but, do, but, and we can push when we have favorable um, bodies in the general assembly, we can push for laws that give laws like this teeth. Well, um, I think, I think that though, that what everyone in Virginia and a lot of other States need to start working on is a couple of different things. Number one, I think that those that call themselves on the, the right Republicans, if you want to call them that um, need to be a little bit more accommodating with the, their tent. Um, I think that there is, for some reason, this checklist of issues that if you check every one of them off, well, then good, you can be with us in the Republican Party. But God forbid you disagree on one or two core issues. Suddenly, you know, you're a rhino. We can't have you in this party anymore. And I think the Republicans do a terrible job of always focusing on what separates us and never focusing on what makes us or what we have in common. I'll give you another issue. What's the largest group? What's the fastest three groups of gun owning Americans in the United States right now? It's well, I, women, yeah. minorities, and those in the LGBTQ community. Oh, I didn't the know that. One. Fastest growing gun owning communities in the United States. 
do we see the outreach to those communities from the Second Amendment community or to Republicans? Can we focus on some things that we have in common? We may not see the whole world the same way, but we all agree that everyone has the right to live the life they choose for themselves and to protect it. And so I really think that what I hope that a lot of your listeners are going to understand is, is that we're so frequently worried that our, our rights are going to be taken from us from the top down. But take it from somebody in Washington State or talk to anyone in California or Illinois. Your rights are taken from the bottom up. It's your state legislature that does it to you. It's not the federal yeah, government. Yeah, it's not the federal it's, government. Congress doesn't have the clout to pass a real significant piece of gun control legislation. Everyone's too afraid to do it back there. But your state legislature, oh, they will disarm you. In fact, if you didn't have a governor with the backbone that you did, how many pieces of civilian disarmament legislation would have been shoved down the citizens of Virginia this legislative session? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. Well, I, our organization is, uh, we, we're basically open to anybody that believes in the Second Amendment. And that and uh, that's uh, where we need to be. We really yeah, do. We need to be there. In our policy from day one. Yep. It's like, we can, we, you know, there's other groups for other things. You can join them, too, if you want to, if you're into other things. But for gun rights, we'd like to have everybody under the same umbrella saying, you know, we disagree on a bunch of stuff, but our life, our right to be alive, to protect ourselves, our families. To be able to live so that we can have those disagreements and exactly. that dialogue. About exactly. That, yeah. Right? Yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's getting up on 930. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Pat, did you see any comments that, that maybe real fast that need to be addressed? Or? Um, I was trying to watch them as best I could. But. Yeah, I, I think we pretty much touched on all of them. Um, I will say, for those of you wondering how you can fight um, gun control in Virginia and around the country, um, you can join organizations like VCDL. There's a QR code on the screen and a web address. Um, VCDL does have several lawsuits going right now, and um, if you want to help support those, there's another QR code on the screen where you can pop onto Kofi. Kofi does not take a fee, so um, if you donate through that, then uh, the money just all goes to VCDL, or you can go to vcdl.org slash donate. Um, Philip doesn't like to ask for money, and frankly, I don't either. But fighting these lawsuits and fighting for our yeah. rights takes money. So, well, let me let me let me uh, do it for you guys real quick. I'll do it for you because it's the dirty work. But I will I will say <laughs> to, all, to all your viewers out there, listen. Should you not only be joining the national organizations, the Second Amendment foundations, the Firearms Policy Coalitions, the Gun Owners of America? Yes, you should be joining those. But but I have found that every single state has a unique local organization that is really absolutely Johnny on the spot. They're the ones that got the lobbyists down in the state capitol. They're the ones that got the lawyers that are filing for the injunctions right away. They got their boots on the ground. So what I would say to all the viewers is, is yes, join your local organization in addition to joining the national organization because the one that's going to be most responsive and the one that you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of is actually your local state organization. That's the truth. And yep. by the way, William, uh, give give everybody your contact information because if you're not watching uh, William's YouTube and all the stuff he puts, that's not just watching the state. It's mostly it's all around. He's watching the whole country, right? And uh, having that that legal analysis is very important. So give them your information. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. You. So the channel is Washington Gun Law. We just crossed three hundred fifty thousand subscribers. The website wow. is WashingtonGunLaw.com, and Twitter is at Gun Washington. And what I really try to do out there, if you're not a subscriber, is, is that um, I just I don't want to tell anybody how to think, but I do want to give you all the stuff to think about. And that's what we do at Washington Gun Law is we give you we take very complicated pieces of legislation. We break it down into simple bite sized simple English pieces so that everyone, when you're done watching the video, you will go. Now I know what this is all about. Now I know what I need to think about before I make up my mind on this issue. So, uh, yeah, we'll always try to give it to you straight. And we do cover issues all around the country. We are called Washington Gun Law because that's where I started this whole thing. But like I say, I got more subscribers in Illinois now than Washington State. 
<laughs> and I did. I, I was able to do some videos on Virginia out there and kind of be able to start building a Virginia audience. And so, and, and the folks out there have been wonderful to me. So thanks to all of them. Sure. If there's anything you need from us, you know how to get a hold of me. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And I've been a subscriber of Washington Gun Law for quite a while. Um, he put some good stuff out there, and and. Um, it, I can trust, I know I can trust the information that he puts out there because he doesn't just uh, spit it out without thinking about it or researching it first. Right. And I'm not going to clickbait people. So if I have a title that says, hey, this is a big case, I'm, I'm saying it because it's actually a big case, you know? Right. So, uh, yeah, you're um, fast and, too. And listen, you know, best of luck to everyone out in Virginia. I, you, you get that razor thin margin. I think your elections over the next couple of years and Virginia has always been an interesting bellwether state that I, I think a lot of people like to carefully watch. So best of luck to you guys. And let me know if there's anything Washington gun law can do to help the folks out in Virginia as well. All right. Yeah. Well, we yeah appreciate you. you. Appreciate you coming on William and appreciate all you viewers out there. Um, please do all the YouTube things and all the Facebook things. Um, share it, like it, comment, all that stuff. And we will see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye.